Welcome to another episode of the Sum Engineering Podcast. Today we have Jonathan Bernales from Econu. Econu is a French startup, actually a Luxembourg-based startup. It's a retirement saving solution for the French market. Jonathan, welcome. Hi Lars, thanks for having me. It's great to have you. Why don't we start with your role? What do you do at Econu? So I'm a DevOps engineer at Econu for the past two years. Uh, and the DevOps engineer role at Econu is... Uh, it covers a different, a lot of different functions. One of the main functions would be defining the, the cloud architecture that we use, the AWS architecture that we use at Econu. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's also this part of automation, uh, continuous in setting up robust continuous integration and continuous delivery pipelines, basically to, mess, to make developer lives easier when it comes to developing and uh, pushing uh, our code into the, the production environment. So those are two technical aspects of the role. And there's also this uh, human side, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, trying to share the best practices regarding the shift left approach, uh, making everybody uh, gain ownership of the different problematics, whether it is cybersecurity, uh, costs of the infrastructure, and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. Before we go into that human aspect and how you deliver code, can we briefly talk about, uh, we talked before we prepped for this podcast and we talked about the actual product, right? That Econu is, it's not just one product. There's two parts to the platform, correct? There's one for the, maybe you talk, you can, you can tell better <laughs> how sure. it works. So Econu is going to have two main targets. One main target is going to be the, the, the companies that are going to provide the insurance plans uh, to the, to the customers. Okay. So this will be an employee benefit. And this is, this is basically materialized as a web application uh, to which companies can onboard their own employees to provide them with this or this or that benefit to the, to the saving plan. And on the other side, we also provide the end user uh, mobile applications, allowing them to connect to their portfolio, invest on the different funds uh, and manage basically the retirement funds uh, and their pension plans for, uh, to the retirement uh, horizon. Great. That's that. So it's really two products, right? And, yes. and that you're building. And because it's finance, it's also regulated, right? So you're, uh, yeah, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But I, wanna, I want to double click on the human aspect, what mm -hmm. you said, right? And I know that you don't have a production team there at Econu. It's like you've organized things a little bit differently, right? You mentioned shift left and talk about the things you're putting into the developer's hands in terms of responsibility. Sure. So basically, the approach at Econu uh, has always been to make everybody responsible as a small startup that began, uh, that was created a couple of years ago. One thing that was done very quickly and uh, I think is really appreciated uh, within the company is that everybody takes ownership of the different problematics when it comes to development and the production side. So basically, our role is to provide the different tooling and the, the, the training necessary to each developer to know uh, how to develop code which is robust and secure. On that side, developers are better than us, uh, even if we have sometimes some uh, elements to, to share. But also uh, on the infrastructure side, we want to know that your code is uh, deployed in, a, in an efficient way, uh, whether it is on the security side on how you configure the services in which your code is going to run, uh, but also on the cost side. So basically, mm -hmm. since our infrastructure uh, is defined as infrastructure as code, and our developers define themselves the, infra the infrastructure in which their code is going to rely, they have to know and to know um, how uh, secure and how optimum their infrastructure is. So basically, on that side, we provide some guidance, and uh, yeah. So I think that. Today, 15, uh, around 15 developers on the, on the backend side, they're def they are completely, uh, they have the complete ownership on the infrastructure that they use and we collaborate with them obviously constantly, uh, but they know how much is going to cost and how security is and the best practice, for example, API gateway authorizer with Cognito, et cetera, et cetera. That's interesting. So can we talk a little bit, let, let's peel the onion here. So you're teaching them, you're an AWS shop, right? You're running 100% AWS yet, yes. right? So you're educating them about specific AWS services before they're allowed to use them. Broadly correct? Uh, 
yes and no. Sometimes they are even uh, able to provide, to suggest the services that they want to use. And uh, as they might encounter a new need, uh, they might say, hey, I've, I've thought, I've figured out that AWS released this kind of new service. Should we try it? Should we not? And then together we are able to uh, decide on the products that we use. But it's not something that goes one way. The, once someone has the ownership of the infrastructures themselves, they are also able to provide and suggest new ways of implementing stuff. Got it. Okay. And then you said you want them to enable, you want to enable them to write robust code, secure code, mm -hmm. have secure infrastructure, has co have cost efficient infrastructure. How do you measure that? How do you, or how can they verify that what they're doing is the right thing? How do you do that? Let's start maybe with the security aspect. Yeah. So on the security aspect, we have some uh, some different uh, requirements. So uh, just to give a bit of context, all the code that arrives into a repository in the master branch at Econu is the code that is going to go from the test environment to our sandbox environments and then until the production environments. Okay. And in order to allow the code to reach this master sort of gateway, we have different constraints of so human processes. So for example, whenever a developer makes a pull request, it has to be approved by two distinct peers. Okay. Mm -hmm. And when it involves infrastructure, sometimes we are involved as well into, into the, the review of such infrastructure. So on that okay. side, we have, a, uh, we have this first point of, uh, of measurement, how quickly the pull requests are being merged, how are there comments, are there any uh, inconsistencies on all these, uh, these elements. Mm -hmm. We also have automated checks once these things are approved on the continuous integration pipeline. We have checks which are going to verify that the infrastructure uh, is uh, respects our different guidelines. For example, API gateway shouldn't be exposed and the, the obviously famous uh, the S3 bucket, which is yeah. going to be public. So for example, this is something that we block on the, C, on the, on the continuous integration pipeline as it is mm -hmm. infrastructure as code. So this is quite easy on that, on that side. When you, when you block it, that means the deploy failed or? Yes. So yes. there isn't even a deploy. We, we parse the template and if there is a missing rule or something that is not correctly configured, the build, the, the build stops and nothing is deployed. To the, to Got it. Okay. What is that? So you're an infrastructure as code shop. What's the tool chain you use? Is so, it CloudFormation or, Hash or, or Terraform? We use uh, SAM and uh, CloudFormation. Okay. Mm -hmm. So on that side, to define the infrastructure, we use those two uh, main uh, components and everything runs on a GitHub Actions. Uh, our repositories are stored in, uh, in GitHub and everything runs on GitHub Actions. Mm -hmm. Okay. And one tool that we use that has been very helpful is the CloudFormation linter, which is what we have implemented in the, in the CI uh, of, uh, at Econu, which allows you to parse the different templates and set up custom rules for example, with the public S3 bucket that allows mm -hmm. us to control the, the deployment of uh, public buckets or unencrypted buckets. Mm -hmm. okay. Great. Now, um, let's talk a little bit about the cost of your infrastructure. Now, you're a startup, you're in growth mode, right? And mm -hmm. in my experience, as long as the number is somewhat in sync with, with the top line growth, you're fine, right? The number being how much are we spending on our AWS infrastructure, right? Yeah. Um, but I found it surprising that you said you make them responsible for cost because I would I would argue 95% of companies do not do that. It may be wrong, but that from what I can tell, there's a, like, there's a shift to doing that. And there are a few startups like InfraCost who are trying like, to enable developers. But how, how do you do this at Equinu? How do you enable them to have visibility into costs? And how do you make them feel responsible about it? Sure. So we have this shift left approach, as you mentioned. And uh, since all our infrastructure is infrastructure as code, uh, and there's one thing that uh, I forgot to mention, which is that each developer has is administrator of their own AWS account. Okay. So they, they can do whatever they want. They are owners of it. Uh, we monitor the cost. Obviously, uh, the cost is uh, uh, insured by the, the pay, paying the bills are is insured by Econu, but they are responsible for their own infrastructure uh, for their own uh, their own account. And what they do is basically, if they are going to develop, they want to develop in the, the situation the closest as possible as production. So they deploy the whole infrastructure in their account. And basically, we monitor the cost of each developer account whenever they, they try a new service or anything is going on. Uh, 
we make them responsible. So basically, they they are they check by themselves is uh, if everything is all right regarding the cost usage or if something exploded for one or another reason. Okay, sometimes we there will be some developments that are going to to incur an additional cost, such as a, a data lake generation, like a glue jobs uh, for for big data, and this uh, each developer is. Um, has sufficient ownership to to know when they're not working anymore on something and they should uninstall a product, then they simply uh, uninstall it. So it's really a shift in mindset, really. You're telling them, look, this is your account, it's your responsibility, and we're checking the number. And if something is wrong, then we're going to point it out, right? Yeah, yeah. And it... In the end, everything, it's actually surprising that uh, everybody has been uh, super... Um, what term should I use? Uh, everybody has been, uh, since everybody has ownership of, of the thing, the, everybody has taken care of it as if it was their own uh, AWS account and their own billing. So we, we haven't had any problems when it comes to uh, excessive costs. And actually it's on the other side. Sometimes we have to let them know that they are allowed to try out new things and that there is, uh, that's absolutely not a problem. Interesting. And they have each each developer has exactly one account and one account only or no. So each developer has their developer account where they can do whatever they want, but then they have access to the test environment and uh, the staging environment. So yeah. they are administrator okay. of their own test and uh, staging. Mm -hmm. And and how do you set up your accounts from an organizational perspective? And where do you get the uh, the bill? I mean, I, 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 I think I know the answer, but uh, <laughs> where do you get the cost information from? Yeah, so all our accounts are centrally managed uh, thanks to AWS organizations. It's actually surprisingly easy to create or delete or manage accounts uh, for everybody joining or leaving the, the company. Uh, and this AWS organization thing allows us to have a root account, which is going to oversee the cost of all the different accounts. So basically from this, we use the cost, uh, the cost analyzer and the billing services from AWS, and we're able to break down the cost either by account, by AWS account, or by service, or by, we can also play with the dates and have the level of granularity that we need for this. Mm -hmm. Got it. And And so really you're relying on common sense and making cost efficiency part of good engineering. That's what yeah, I'm absolutely. hearing. Yeah, yes, absolutely. So the, it's, it's actually quite simple because, well, I don't think it's quite simple, obviously, but um, the, the fact that AWS services costs, uh, depending on how quickly your services are going to react to the kind of queries and how you use them is very often, uh, correlated to uh, the cost it's going to have. So for example, for DynamoDB, it's, it has been uh, quite obvious that we shouldn't just scan the whole table in order to obtain a result. We use global secondary indexes. We try to only use specific queries. So this is the kind of thing where uh, a developer might have at some point uh, tried out uh, and said, hey, this query is taking me too long. And this allows us to very easily say, hey, this is going to first be expensive. It's not scalable and uh, it's not the way the product is designed to be used for. Got it, got it. So um, we, we've covered the human aspect, how you deploy software, the different product, the two different products you have. Mm -hmm. Can we talk a little bit about your architecture? Yes. Now you're a uh, 100% cloud native, correct? Yep, absolutely. And that's the first one in Luxembourg. Yeah, so as, as we are aware of, uh, Econu is the first financial institution regulated and approved by the regulator to be 100% cloud native, meaning that we do not have any single server uh, on site when it comes to our infrastructure client facing. And this allows us to, so we use uh, AWS uh, and uh, only the serverless services, basically. So we have set up a um, uh, microservices infrastructure uh, by using different services from AWS, exclusively from AWS, uh, such as Lambda functions, step functions, uh, the API gateways for communication, uh, for public communication, Cognito for authorization, and these kind of, uh, of elements. So you're 100% cloud native, you're 100% AWS shop, and you're, uh, it's, it's a microservices architecture, and you're 100% serverless, right? So we're talking Lambda, 
uh, uh, Cognito. So if you if you if you're out to throw out a few AWS product names, which which are the ones that are that that matter? I can go with what a microservices at Econ because when you do mm -hmm. microservice, the most important is to define what you're expecting all of your micro or most of your microservices to to behave mm -hmm. like. So each microservices is divided in three. So the first part is the communication layer, how your microservices is going to communicate with other microservices or externally. So for that, we have two services, mainly API gateway for external communication, whenever it's for the web application or our mobile applications. And we also use Event Bridge as a communication between our microservices. Okay, so these are the only two ways that microservices communicate uh, between them at Econo. Okay, so this mm -hmm. is on the communication side. On the computing side, so what the microservice is going to do with the data it receives, we use step functions to orchestrate uh, the different Lambda functions that go uh, behind that. Okay, so mm -hmm. we exclusively use Lambda functions for processing, calculation, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, mm -hmm. and there is the storage part that each microservice has, or maybe not, but they can have the storage, which uh, is either an S3 bucket or a DynamoDB, uh, which is ser uh, which is obviously serverless, and in some cases when it's necessary we use relational databases, so we use Aurora serverless. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. so these are this is basically a very quick overview of what a microservice looks like at Econo and the services that we use for ninety nine percent of our services. Yeah, yeah, and and then so obviously you're in a great place, you're in a happy place, it's all working. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure you have also your, you know, your challenges, but is that how you started or no, no, no okay. absolutely not. <laughs> we are, we started in a, it was, it was actually, a, we started in a way, um, if I think about it right now, it's quite uh, obvious that it was going to fail on the infrastructure side, but I mean, you need to try it and fail before you go to something mature uh, in terms of architecture. So we basically started with a microservice, with a monolith. Uh, this monolith was composed by an API gateway and all the Lambda functions of, of, of all our infrastructure uh, plugged to that API gateway and then one or two uh, databases plugged to that. And the problem with that is that we very quickly realized that we had limitations when it came to cloud formation limits, uh, account uh, quotas, service quota limits, which we, could, we couldn't increase. And we basically had to, it was a monolith. It allows us to, to see what are the parts that were necessary to, to, to the product, how each part was supposed to communicate between each other, but it definitely wasn't meant to, to even work on a, at a small case, a small scale. So yeah, we, we actually had to scratch that down uh, and start over by defining what we mentioned before of what a microservice should be at Econo. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and uh, how did AWS help you with that? Yeah, so since the beginning, we've, we've been followed by our account manager and our solutions architect, uh, which have been super helpful when it came to uh, product decisions and technical questions, no matter how technical they were or detailed. Uh, we were helped by AWS on that, and they've been following us since the beginning. We've been able to do a well-architected review uh, since then, uh, and they are actually the ones eager to help us on the different uh, on the different topics that we might encounter. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that was actually a very positive and surprising experience uh, when it came to support from AWS and the follow-up. Because you're, let's face it, you're a small customer, right? In the yeah. grand scheme of things, right? Yet you, you got, yeah, yeah, yeah. So then um, with all these lessons learned, what is your, what are your recommendations? So I, look, there's constant innovation going on. Companies start from scratch, startups, but also enterprise like big banks are still trying to move in the cloud. Mm -hmm. What are some of your lessons learned if you were to start all over again today what are the things you'd say, I wish I would have done that from day one? <laughs> yeah. So I think that definitely uh, the choice of going all in into a cloud provider has disadvantages, obviously, risk and the cyber uh, constraints that you might encounter. But this is something that I think actually was a very good decision that allowed us to go very quickly because you enter an ecosystem, you are yet, you are indeed locked up in that ecosystem when you build your infrastructure, but it allows you to deliver 
value to the end customer so quickly and so efficiently. And you realize that each product is meant to, to fit together. You have even bridge, which is going to work very well with the step functions and the simple queue service for, for queues. So I think that this is something very positive that I, that I would like to, 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 to share on that side. And mm -hmm. things that I think would have been able to, I think that what I would do over again is the fact that we, the own, when you grant people ownership of a topic, I was a bit scared of this at some point where we would have developer accounts worth uh, 10,000 euros per month uh, of uh, unexpected costs on these kinds of elements. But I think that you shouldn't, you should never be afraid of granting people ownership with everything that uh, relates to their work environment and especially developers. Uh, they are eager to, we've had super positive feedback and experiences with that. They're super eager to improve, uh, question things and, uh, yeah, I think that this is something that I would do over again. Because they're really stewards now of their own business or accounts. They're they're behaving responsibly. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And one one last thing is one one tip I would uh, would like to share is that you shouldn't be afraid of failing. And uh, this might sound super obvious, and many people say that uh, failure is uh, is an option you can try, but especially in cloud computing. Uh, we have had to scratch things over and over again until we've been able to find out the right way to build things. And this is something that you can do quickly. And if you're aware that you're doing something wrong or you're unsure, uh, and you have confirmation from your, from the AWS experts, don't be afraid of starting over and recognizing a failure and trying to apply it to, to other projects. Mm -hmm. But that's part of your company culture too, right? Yes. That, that, yes. Yes, which is, I mean, that's a big thing, right? If if uh, failure is acceptable, then it, it promotes a bunch of innovation. Yeah. Okay, uh, Jonathan, this was a fantastic talk. Thank you so much. Thank you again and, for the questions. Yes, and uh, what I like, oh, what, I, what I always like to do is um, yeah, things move so quickly. I'm going to ask you to uh, appear as a guest again in about a year's time, and then we'll see how things changed. Oh, awesome. Sure. Yeah. I'm not for that. <laughs> awesome. Uh, so thank you, Jonathan. Um, so we covered a, a lot of ground here, how you develop secure applications at Econu and how you empower your developers to be the stewards of their own cloud accounts and businesses. Mm -hmm. And um, sh how can people reach you? How can people uh, talk to you if they're interested in finding out more? What's a good way to reach you? Sure. So feel, feel free to contact us either through LinkedIn. We have a public website, uh, www.econu.com. I'm available on, uh, on LinkedIn mainly, Twitter as well. So don't hesitate to, to reach out to me if you have any questions. But again, I'm a single person presenting the, the work of a lot of people behind me. So feel free to reach us globally and we will get in touch and uh, answer happily. And I assume you're hiring at Econu as well? Absolutely. So uh, everything is available on our on our public website, on our LinkedIn website as well. Fantastic. Jonathan, thank you so much. I'll talk to you next time. Thank you for having me, Lars.